Everybody will take your seats. We'll, uh, we'll get settled in for the, the lunch and keynote. But, uh, but before James uh, introduces Judge Sholin, I hope you'll uh, humor me while I just say a few words about the Seaboyd and Gray Center. Uh, the Seaboyd and Gray Center for the Study of the Administrative State was founded at George Mason University's Law School about three years ago uh, by Dean Henry Butler and Professor Naomi Rao, who's now in the White House doing regulatory oversight. Uh, their idea was that with increasing debate in the courts and in Congress uh, and in the, uh, the administrative agencies and the executive branch, over some long settled questions of administrative law and new questions that were arising, they thought it would be good to have a home near Washington, an academic home for some of these emerging debates. And so we founded the center first and foremost as a, a, a program for encouraging legal scholars from across the country to come and write papers and discuss some of these emerging issues. Uh, and we sort of have three categories for what we do. One is just straight administrative law topics, Chevron deference and so on. The second area that we focus on is the intersection of administrative agencies with other constitutional or legal values. Right? We've had programs on due process in the agencies, free speech in, in the agencies, and so on. And then third, sometimes we pick a subject like uh, energy regulation, veterans law, and so on, just a subject matter specific uh, topic for discussion. But we're chatting at lunch and, and, and we're discussing one of the things that, that I like best about getting to run this program, uh, it's not just the food, well that's nice, um, but also the fact that one of our goals is to take administrative law, administrative lawyers and law professors and, and connect them with specialists in specific fields like veterans law. The idea being that there's always some useful dialogue and, and education and somebody said cross-pollination, pollinization uh, in both directions, right? The administrative law generalists have a lot to learn from the specialists in any given agency or field and vice versa. Hopefully the specialists sometimes can benefit from uh, the, the broader debates that are happening in administrative law. And so that's what we try to do here and uh, I'm so pleased that you all could join us today for an example of this. Uh, we actually have a second event tonight. I just love talking about this one. Tonight we're going to have a debate, uh, a, a lecture, um, co-organized with the National Civic Arts Society. It's President Justin Shubo is with us today. And the topic is called the, uh, the Architecture of Bureaucracy. And we, we mean that literally. We have a scholar of architecture coming to talk about the transition from classical architecture in Washington, D.C. over towards the more modern style. And just think about the, the ideas and influences that helped uh, animate that change. Um, next week we have a program over at the law school. Most of our programs are over at the law school on permits, licenses, and the administrative state. And I know that sounds extremely dull, um, even more dull maybe than your usual administrative law fair. But the actual panel discussions are going to be fascinating. We have one on fintech, financial technology, and bank chartering. We have one on energy infrastructure. We have one on the FDA and its gatekeeping role on modern technology and pharmaceuticals. And our third panel is on uh, marketable permits, you know, cap and trade and so on, with an array of scholars and practitioners. Uh, recent FTC Commissioner Maureen Olhausen is going to speak. Judge Stephen Williams of the DC Circuit will speak. Uh, so if you're interested in these subjects, please go on the website. And RSVP, believe me, there's plenty of open seats uh, next week for that event. Um, just two final words before turning it over to James. I did want to just observe uh, the happy coincidence of having this particular discussion here in this particular place. Um, I, I'm sure that folks in this room are familiar with Stephen Decatur, a right, legendary patriot, a Navy Commodore, patriotic hero of the young American Republic. Uh, that's his home. When it was built, when he built it, it was the only residence in the White House neighborhood. Um, obviously things have filled in a little bit since then. But we thought that this would be just an ideal place to have this discussion with uh, the history of veterans and veterans benefits in mind. One other connection I wanted to identify though, and this really is a happy coincidence, our program is named for C. Boyden Gray, the former White House counsel, former ambassador to Europe. But if you wander around the grounds a little bit, you'll find in the hallway a bust of Gordon Gray. It happens to be Boyden's father. Gordon Gray was, among other things, Secretary of the Army under President Truman. 
He was national security advisor under uh, President Eisenhower. And so we just thought that was a, a happy coincidence of our organization and, and this place. As you can see from the podium, this, uh, this, uh, this is operated by the White House Historic Association. The reason why I hesitated, I have to grab it out of my bag. familiar with a lot of the work of the White House Historical Association, I couldn't help but say um, I bought my annual White House Christmas ornament this morning. <laughs> uh, and it's great. This year they're celebrating Henry, uh, Harry Truman. It's a view of the, the Truman uh, uh, balcony on the south portico of the White House. And so if you do get a chance to wander around the grounds and see the historical, item, the historical exhibit in the hallway out there, uh, if you are thinking about getting a White House Christmas ornament, uh, check it out, and I promise I'm not getting a discount on the room by advertising these things. Um, before I turn over to James, just one last thing. I did want to recognize a few of the judges in the audience. From the Board of Veterans Appeals, I see we have Judge Jonathan Hager and uh, Judge Victoria, I'm so sorry in advance, Judge uh, Victoria Moshishwili. Moshi I come close? I'm sorry, Judge. Uh, my, they gave me simple names. I have a simple name for a reason. I can't handle anything complicated. But thank you very, very much for joining us today, Judge, Judge Hager. We're also joined uh, by Judge Joseph Toth, Judge Joseph Falvey, and then finally our, our last judge, I think, in attendance today, and I'll let James introduce her, Judge Mary Sholin. So James, if you would, please. Thank you again, Adam. And you've heard too much from me, so I will keep this brief. Um, our keynote speaker today uh, has her own connection to uh, the Founding Fathers, having gone to one of the other area law school named after a famous George. Um, and uh, she now serves as a judge on the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, where she's been since December of 2004. But when you look at her bio in the record, and I, I won't read it all to you, you can see that when she was in law school, she did work for NVLSP, where she represented veterans before the Vet Board of Veterans Appeals, and spent some time as a staff attorney for Vietnam Veterans of America, uh, but spent a great deal of her time working uh, on the United States Senate Committee of Veterans Affairs staff, where she held a variety of positions, including Minority Counsel, Minority General Counsel, Deputy Staff Director for Benefits Programs, uh, and so on and so forth. So to the extent that our topic today is the relationship between the Hill and the courts and the service organizations and the agency, I can think of no better speaker to come give us the answers to all of our problems than our keynote speaker today, Judge Mary Sholin. Yeah, way to oversell that. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm way shorter than James. Um, thank you, James and Professor White and George Mason and the Gray Center for inviting me to speak today. Uh, Professor White asked me to speak about some of the challenges that the court is facing, so I thought I'd discuss the court's efforts to implement the Federal Circuit's decision that we have the authority to uh, entertain class actions. I'm calling this talk More Questions Than Answers, and I'm pretty sure you'll understand why when I'm done. But for those of you who are not familiar with our court, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about us, and so then you can appreciate the complexity of the challenge that we're facing. For those of you who already know about us, please continue eating your dessert, check your messages, do whatever you need to do. <laughs> um, also, I'll be reserving a chunk of time at the end for questions, so please start thinking of them now. Uh, I don't want to stand up here looking pathetic, and um, it's your chance to turn the tables and ask the judge questions, so you don't get to do that very much. Uh, so here's a little primer on the Veterans Court. The court was created by Congress in 1988 following more than a decade of debate about whether there should be judicial review or what format it should take. Ultimately, Congress decided to create an Article I appellate court outside of VA that reviews final agency decisions made by the Board of Veterans Appeals, who we've talked a lot about today. Um, we have no antecedent trial court. We review findings of fact made by the agency on a deferential standard. We review findings of law de novo. Because Congress anticipated a significant volume of appeals, it authorized the Veterans Court to hear appeals as a single judge, 
or in panels. Typically, cases heard by a single judge don't present a legal question of first impression. Panels can make precedential decisions that are binding on the agency. Appeals from the Veterans Court go to another appellate court, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. They can't review our determinations regarding facts, but they can review uh, the validity of our, deter our decisions on uh, regulations, interpretations of statutes, and that review is de novo. From there, our appeals go to the Supreme Court, and they've taken up about half a dozen cases of ours over the years. In addition to reviewing Board of Veterans' Appeals decisions, we have authority to hear petitions for writs of mandamus under the All Writs Act. Our judges are nominated by the President and confirmed by the Senate to a term of 15 years. We have statutory authority for seven judges, but we currently have two additional judges under temporary authority. We have, for each of the last 10 years or so, received around 4,000 notices of appeal from, um, from the BVA decisions, plus petitions, plus requests for fees under the Equal Access to Justice Act. In the fiscal year that just ended, um, we received approximately 7,000 notices of appeal because of the significantly increased output of the board that you saw earlier. Okay, now that you're all up to speed, Let's turn to the word of the day, class actions. So historically, the court had said we didn't have authority to entertain class actions and that they were unnecessary. In 1991, in a pair of cases, Harrison and Lefkowitz v. Derwinski, the court laid out its reasoning. First, it said that it didn't have the authority because its jurisdictional statute said we review board decisions and adversely affected individuals must file a notice of appeal with the court. The court thought it was unnecessary because it issues precedential decisions that are binding on VA. Further, the court thought such a procedure in an appellate court would be highly unmanageable. Well, fast forward to 2015. When the Veterans Court denied the petition for a uh, writ of mandamus for a veteran named Conley Monk, Mr. Monk sought to bring a class action basically on behalf of veterans who have been waiting more than 12 months for a decision after the time of filing a notice of disagreement with the regional office initial denial of benefits. The Veterans Court in a single judge decision separately denied the merits of Mr. Monk's decision and uh, petition as well as his request for aggregate action. Mr. Monk appealed this to the Federal Circuit. In 2017, the Federal Circuit reversed the Veterans Court decision that we lacked the authority to hear class actions, holding that although Rule 23 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure did not apply, there were several sources of authority for the Veterans Court to entertain class actions, namely under the All Writs Act, under the Veterans Court Jurisdictional Statute, Title 38, Section 7261, which provides authority to compel action of the Secretary unlawfully withheld or unreasonably delayed, and because the Congress granted the Veterans Court the express authority to create its own procedures and rules other tribunals, such as the EEOC, have relied on similar statutes to aggregate claims. And it also found that there was no indication in the statute that created the court that Congress intended such review authority to not include class actions. And the Federal Circuit thought that um, um, class actions would prevent VA from being able to moot out uh, individual mandamus petitions by selling cases or resolving those, effectively preventing the Veterans Court from reviewing VA's systemic delays in adjudicating appeals. Finally, the Federal Circuit returned Mr. Monk's case to the Veterans Court to consider whether a class should be certified in this case and whether the delay to veterans who've been waiting more than a year for decision from VA was a violation of the Due Process Clause. So the Veterans Court issued a decision on August 23, 2018, and in all candor, I wrote most of it, um, and my law clerk did a ton, but, um, and that provided some answers about what the court's going to do in the class action contest, and we decided three things. First, the court did have authority to hear class actions in a writ of mandamus context. Second, we would follow Rule 23 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure as a guide, and third, in a four to four decision, our newest colleague was not on the court for the oral argument of the conference, so he couldn't um, participate in the decision. Um, we denied the motion to certify the class, primarily because it failed the commonality prong of Rule 23, um, as the petitioners asserted delay 
for any reason was the common injury and was unreasonable. And the court decided that the reasons for the delay were different or could be different. For example, a veteran might be submitting additional evidence or VA could be seeking to schedule an exam or something like that, such that there was no common question and no one thing <clears throat> could be done to provide a common answer or remedy. Uh, since the Federal Circuit reversed the Veterans Court in Monk in 2017, many other class actions have already been filed at our court as, on a variety of topics. As of last week, I counted 11. Um, I'd like to share some of them with you so you can get a sense of what we're seeing and what the bar is out there doing. Um, the first case we saw was Mr. Rosinski. Uh, Mr. Rosinski is an attorney that practices before VA, and he filed a motion for a class action for a writ of mandamus uh, to compel VA to provide him and all attorneys uh, in, as, in his capacity as an attorney with access to newly completed but not yet promulgated regional office decisions. And that's something that has been reserved for the veteran service organiza organizations. Um, and uh, the court ended up dismissing Mr. Rosinski's petition by finding he couldn't su de demonstrate sufficient injury to him, and therefore he lacked standing without reaching the class question. So that case provided very limited answers to add to this area. Next, we uh, held oral argument on a case called SCORE on September 25th, just last month. Um, the proposed class includes veterans who were present at the cleanup of nuclear materials from a crash of an Air Force plane in 1966 in Palomar, Spain, that was carrying nuclear warheads. Um, and they're basically seeking benefits based on this radiation exposure. Unlike Mr. Monk, the thing that's interesting about this case is this is an appeal. Mr. Monk's was a petition. So we haven't acted on that yet, but we don't know what we're going to do in this context yet. Stay tuned. Um, but the problem is many cases now that of those 11 that have been filed that are presented from an appeal are stayed pending a decision on what we're going to do in this context. One of those waiting is Simon. Mr. Simon appealed the final adverse board decision, and he seeks to certify a class of veterans, a class for veterans who served in the waters of Da Nang Harbor during Vietnam and who have applied for benefits from a disease that VA recognizes as being presumptively related to Agent Orange and filed their claims after a certain date. In that case, is pending score. Mr. Godsey filed a petition for a writ of mandamus on behalf of claimants who've been waiting two or more years for VA to certify their cases from the board after filing a VA Form 9. What all this VA jargon means is that after a veteran has been denied his or her initial request for benefits at a regional office, he or she can appeal to the board. The veteran must complete a VA Form 9 to kind of do their part of the, the appeal. However, then they wait. Um, for something like 773 days on average for VA to issue a certificate of appeal. Then they wait another 321 days on average for their appeal to be transferred to the board. Then there's some additional period of time for the board to actually make a decision and issue a decision. So we're waiting oral argument to be scheduled in that case. Rosinski, this is a test to see if you're paying attention. That name should be familiar to you. <laughs> this is the same attorney who filed the petition that we just talked about a minute ago. He's back. Um, okay, good. You're all with me. He filed an appeal to the, um, this is an appeal this time, of a fee determination the board made. He represented a veteran below, and they won on the merits. VA then awarded Mr. Rosinski uh, his past due, I mean his 20% uh, contingency fee that is paid out of past due benefits that the veteran was entitled to. However, VA first offset the veteran's military retirement pension from that lump sum past due benefit, thus reducing or potentially eliminating Mr. Rosinski's fee and he is challenging this practice and filed a motion for class certification. Briefing and the record were completed in August, and the court hasn't acted on this yet. Um, next, I want to talk to you about two cases, Mr. Ward and Mr. Neal. They were consolidated at the Veterans Court. They have appealed the uh, board decisions that denied service-connected compensation benefits. They're arguing that the standard that VA uses 
in, that's out of their adjudication manual that uh, is, they require for demonstrating aggravation of a pre-existing condition in, is a violation of a regulation. What's particularly interesting about this case is Mr. Neal also filed a motion to suspend secretarial action under the court's Rule 8. He asked the court to enjoin VA from applying this challenge standard to all the claims of members of a proposed class while the appeal is pending. Rule 8 says that um, a, a motion after an appeal or petition has been filed can be requested that the court ordered the secretary to suspend action or stay the precedential effect of a decision of the court. I'm not familiar with the rule ever being used in this context. I've seen it used in the context of suspending a precedential decision of the court. So I was very interested to see what was going to happen. And on October 16th, so this is hot news, just a couple days ago, the panel denied the Rule 8 motion and stayed the class certification motion. And they basically said that they didn't find imminent harm, sort of using kind of the injunctive relief type standards. Um, the court otherwise hasn't acted on the merits of this case. Um, finally, pro se veterans have been um, filing some of these class action cases. Uh, and some of them are appeals, some of them are petitions, and the court hasn't yet acted or figured out what's going to do with those yet. So as you can see, there's quite a variety of topics, types of matters, types of claimants, types of appellants that the court and the Veterans Bar is um, addressing. So now I'm really getting into the more questions and answers part. Here's where the fun really begins. We had to have a crash course in class actions. We've had some heavy hitters in the field come and speak to us. We've read many cases, law review articles, manuals, which still have mostly led me to believe I don't know anything. Uh, here are the questions I'm wrestling with in actuality and existentially. But I'm sure I'll have more as we go along. First, we're an appellate court. How much like a trial court can we become to prosecute these class action claims and still remain an appellate court? You know, one of the earlier panel alluded to that. Um, how are class actions superior to precedential decisions? We're unique in that we're an appellate court as opposed to a trial court. Our decisions reach, in theory, everybody. Traditionally, traditionally class actions are a tool of a trial court because they don't have an effect on other cases. So what is the value, what is the cost, what is the benefit in this context? Advocates have argued the general benefits of speed, uniformity, and enforcement. Does that apply in this context? Would that be true in every case? That's something we're wrestling with. Um, third, the court is limited in what evidence we can look at uh, in appeals from board decisions. We can only review evidence that was before the board or constructively before VA, which typically are medical records that were not associated with the claims file. So how do we reconcile that limitation with fact-finding fact that may need to happen? Relatedly, what mechanisms can we employ to make findings necessary to certify a class? Mandatory disclosures, requiring a preliminary record by the secretary, discovery, FOIA, should the issue, should we issue limited remands and send them back to VA? Should we select a special master? Five, who can be part of a class in an appeal as opposed to a petition or a writ? We have authority to review board decisions, as I discussed. Should veterans have the ability to join the class if their claims are still pending at VA? Or what about those who've received a board decision but didn't timely appeal them? There's cases at the circuit courts and the Supreme Courts um, addressing the need to exhaust administrative remedies or to equitably toll, uh, for example, in the Social Security context. So we're reviewing those. Uh, how does the court deal with non-class related matters that are in the class representative veterans appeal? Should we, you know, for example, this is the class action, but he also has a hand disability. Do we issue a separate decision? Do we hold those? Um, what do we do in the context of a member of the class who has multiple issues before the court? What remedy can the court provide in the absence of a settlement? VA's effective date regulations were written at a time where there were no, no class actions. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. There had been some in the other courts. But they don't really contemplate that. There's limited circumstances where finality can be abated and retroactive awards can be awarded. So in the absence of explicit authority or settlement agreement, 
Can the court order VA to re-adjudicate final claims or award retro, retroactive benefits, or should it only be prospective? Okay, everyone, quick stretch. We're halfway there. <laughs> Don't smack your neighbors. Um, eight, if an appellant is at the court on their own appeal, as we were saying, what, what do we do about their other cases? Are we gonna have to issue more than one judgment and mandate? What if they have different representatives than the class attorney? How do we integrate that uh, complexity? Should manageability issues like these be a factor in determining whether to certify a class? Does the fact that we can issue precedential decisions tilt the scale when manageability issues are present? Uh, rule 23 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure doesn't require notice to a class, um, to class members when it's an injunctive relief type of class action, which would typically be the kinds of cases we would see at our court. But should we require it because we're dealing with veterans? Or should we require it because they may be pursuing their own claims at VA at the same time? And who would be responsible for providing such notice? Rule 23 doesn't contemplate class members being able to opt out in an injunctive relief type setting. But VA advocated in SCORE that if we granted the motion to certify the class, we should allow veterans to opt out so they wouldn't be bound by a potentially negative decision. How would that work if we granted the relief on the merits that Mr. Score sought? Would VA not be bound by that for the opted out veterans if it was precedential? How does that all work together? What would the court's role be in monitoring compliance or ensuring enforcement if we do certify a class and decide in favor of the class? What tools do we use to effectuate that enforcement? Could the court use its Rule 8 authority that I mentioned before to compel action by the secretary? or suspend action, um, 13, we're almost there. Is the discrete decision regarding class certification appealable to the Federal Circuit in the absence of a Rule 23F? The petitioners in Monk filed an appeal to the Federal Circuit on October 3rd, so we'll actually have some sort of answer soon. 14, and finally, should the court allow motions for reconsideration or en banc review on decisions regarding class certification as they are not a dispositive question, or are they? Okay, we made it to the end of the questions. I have to take a breath. So where do we go from here? The court is pursuing a two-track approach. On the one track, we're moving forward, we're hearing cases ad hoc, deciding matters as they are presented to the extent we can. We've determined that we will, at least for now, consider all class action matters in panels, or possibly en banc, rather than as single judges. On the other track, our rules committee is working with our judicial advisory committee to create some rules for class actions at our court. I'd like to briefly share with you some unique preliminary concepts that the subcommittee is considering. First, to require parties seeking a class action to file a separate class action complaint with the clerk of the court fairly early in the process, like before their brief would be due. The complaint would not toll or take the place of a notice of appeal or a petition. And then in turn, the court would create a separate docket for class actions complaints, splitting it off from the rest of the veteran's issues. For example, again, if the veteran had a hand, knee, shoulder, and only sought class action regarding the hand, the knee and the shoulder claims could move forward and proceed separately. Second, they would require the party seeking a class action to explain why a decision granting relief to the class would serve the interests of justice to a greater degree than a precedential decision granting relief. Third, they would assign the class action complaint to a panel of the court. Fourth, they would instruct the clerk of the court, who's here by the way, if you have any questions, Greg, he's, he'll, he's great, <laughs> to place a public notice on the homepage of the court's website providing a link to all the active class action cases. They would not require notice to class, class members except when there's a settlement. And they would specify that appointment of class counsel would not interfere with representation agreements at the agency level. So we've made it to the end. And you can see I was honest up front. I have many more questions than answers. But I hope you can all be part of solving the puzzle and helping the court navigate its way through what my colleague called uncharted waters of an appellate court figuring out how to entertain class actions. I reserve the right to disavow anything I've said today. 
and thank you, and I'd be happy to answer most any questions you have. Amy. Hi. So I can't believe that uh, it's almost 2019. Right? Um, it feels like the end of an era. So what how are the major changes that you've seen since you were uh, put on the bench? Um. Well, I think the volume of cases and the expediency at which the court has dealt with them has been, like, it was pretty early on that the volume hit, but it was a significant change from what the court had experienced before my cohort arrived. Um, uh, the rise of our mediation and um, uh, our conferencing process, I think that's been a significant um, enhancement to our process and helps the chambers deal with the increased volume that we've seen. Um, the complexity, frankly, of the decisions. Uh, I feel like sometimes what I've done here is make things more complicated, not less, <laughs> um, which is frustrating to me, but I think it reflects the complexity of the cases that we're seeing and the sophistication of the bar and the complexity of the arguments that are being presented to us. Great. And what would you like to see in the court's future? I mean, these are these are softballs, right? <laughs> um, well, I would like to see the court um, continue to have the support that it has um, enjoyed from Congress and the veterans community. Uh, I would like to see the court continue to have the number of judges that it requires. Um, the authority for nine judges expires in 2021. Um, and my term is up in 2019, so I hope that my seat will be filled promptly. Um, I would like to serve in senior status, but I don't want to work that hard. <laughs> and um, and I, I hope that uh, we can work together to try and make the process better for veterans and their families. Um, what the court's role exactly is versus the role of the political and executive branches, um, I think is something that I f am struggling with, and I think everybody else is as well. Uh, and that we figure that out. There's a question over here, Professor Marcus. Thank you very much, Judge. That was, that was really interesting. Uh, uh, as someone who spends my time writing about class actions when I'm not hanging out with Dan, I really enjoyed that. Uh, I have two, two questions. One is, I know that in some, some agencies, uh, the, the uh, there's been aggregate procedures developed for lower lower in the uh, review process. So it, in, in HHS, Office of Medicare Hearings, Hearings and Appeals, has devised its own aggregate processing uh, a set, set of rules. And I, so I wonder if you think that um, aggregate processing might be might be possible at the board level, uh, and whether that might respond to some of the, the concerns that you have about class action procedures at, at a court of appeals level. And the second question is just to wonder whether there might, whether you think there's more room for the CAVC to decide cases by presidential decision instead of single judge decision. Whether there are some issues that have been uh, that have been dealt with by single judge decisions that might be addressed by uh, presidential decisions, and and whether doing so might alleviate some of the demand for uh, class action uh, class actions at, at the at the court. Okay, as to your first question of whether this could potentially happen at the lower level, I'm guessing within the agency, um, I don't know that they have the authority for that. I, I, don't, I haven't studied enough what kinds of authorities um, executive agencies have used to implement that. I think Judge Ray would be a really good person to talk to about that. <laughs> but um, I know my chief judge thinks that's where things should happen. Um, they have the information, they have the access to all that kind of stuff, so in a way that would be more efficient. Um, dealing with some of the trust issues that I think um, the prior panel alluded to, would that be satisfactory? I'm not sure. I think there would probably need to be some sort of appellate review of that determination. Um, and maybe that would be a satisfactory process. And I think in a lot of ways that would be simpler for us. Um, but um, 
Sure. <laughs> um, as to deciding more precedential cases, I do think that that is a fair criticism of the court. Um, and partly it's a reflection of the volume that we've dealt with. A lot of times we've had five judges and we have 4,000 appeals coming in the door. So you're doing what you can do. And if you can decide the case based on this issue, as opposed to reaching for a, a panel question that is in there, my impression is a veteran would want his decision as opposed to waiting for a panel decision. Um, we're trying to be better. I think you've seen an increase in volume. Those of us, those of you that, that follow the court, that we've been having a lot more oral arguments. We've been issuing a lot more precedential decisions. Um, I can tell you just personally, sort of historically, I was on around eight panels at any given time, maybe 10. Now I am on average on 20 or more panels at a time. Now, I don't know that we have gotten so good at doing them all simultaneously faster. Is that taking longer to get some out? I'm not really sure. Some of it is also growing pains of new colleagues and new interactions and figuring out how people work together and what they think versus what the old guy that was their thought. Um, so I think that's natural too. But Yes, sir. Hi, Jeff Lovers, American U. Uh, this will probably come up this afternoon, but could you say a few words about the way the court uses or um, applies the Chevron doctrine and the Hour doctrine? Um, we uh, have an interesting tension um, in that we have Chevron on the one hand, but there's also, for those of you familiar with our work, the Gardner uh, matter. Um, I can tell you what I do. Um, my interpretation of what the Federal Circuit has been telling us is Chevron generally applies, sometimes Gardner applies, but mostly Chevron applies and our. And so I tend to defer to the agency if I find them to be reasonable and not arbitrary and capricious and all those standards if there is ambiguity. Um, when you get down to if there is no guidance or there is no whatever, then I think there's a role for Gardner. And should it be a different way? I'm not really sure, but that's what I feel like my reviewing court is telling me to do. Uh, yes, Professor Wishton. It's true, your invitation at the beginning to put a question to a judge is kind of irresistible. So, <laughs> um, so um, I, you started with 14 hard questions, and I guess I wanted to invite you, if, if you uh, were willing, to um, identify among those questions whether there are some, maybe a, a smaller number, that you think are um, the hardest or for the court, the ones that are the most difficult. Uh, some surely have somewhat uh, more straightforward possible answers than others. And, um, and if there are a couple that are at the heart of what the court as a whole is struggling with, if you wanted to say anything a little bit further, not about the answers, but about the nature of the question. Um, well, I can speak personally. I think for me, the relationship of us being an appellate court and having the ability to issue precedential decisions versus the need of a trial court to aggregate claims for efficiency and um, predictability or whatever, that tension is something I'm struggling with. Um, I think the, the questions of like, how do we deal with multiple claims and things like that, that's something that we can work out. Um, you know, sort of the existential questions of our very nature, I think those are the hard ones for me. Um, how do we deal with um, the fact that folks are, um, we're an appellate court, should they be having to file an appeal? What if they're still at the agency? Things like that. Those are things I'm struggling with. Anybody else? I think we've reached our end. <laughs>